Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Belk. <laughs> and Mr. Michael Moore. So welcome to Talks to Google, everyone. I'm Kevin Velk, as Mr. Moore just introduced me. And uh, this is Michael Moore, filmmaker, documentary, document, document, documentary filmmaker. There it is. Yeah, documentarian. And, uh, word. you know, writer, producer of all this. I hate so. that word. Which one? Documentarian. Yeah, I know. I couldn't they, say it. I should. Well, you don't, you don't like call Scorsese a fictionitarian. That's true. <laughs> so it's like I, I choose nonfiction, others choose fiction, but you're, we're filmmakers. I, I, I wish I want. I've been trying to drive this home to more documentary filmmakers, and it. If they made documentaries as movies and not as documentaries, more people might go watch them. That is true. So, you know, it's, um, it's all about what we're going to do on Friday night. So, right? <laughs> I apologize. Um, no, no, don't apologize. No, no, I'm just. <laughs> you see, you have a series of films. Michael Moore today received an official apology from Google. <laughs> You have a series of films. So that your new film, uh, Where to Invade and Access, comes after uh, Roger and Me, The Awful Truth, Bowling for Calibine, uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, Sicko, Capitalism, A Love Story. So uh, many of us... Don't forget Canadian Bacon. And Canadian Bacon. All right. And uh, many of us saw the film just now, but can you just go into what the film was about and uh, where the idea came from? Well, uh, I've had this idea probably since I was 19, although I wasn't a filmmaker then. I was just a, a kid with a youth hostel card and a year rail pass and uh, went over to Europe on one of those $99 flights and uh, backpacked for two months and saw, saw the way it was elsewhere than here. And every country I, I would go to, I would say, God, that's such a good idea, the way they do that. Why don't we do that? Or, you know, oh, that's so simple. It's so obvious. You know, it's like, and, and every time I've traveled since I was 19, I've had this thought wherever I was in the world that, there's always like this really good little idea, and how come we don't just steal that idea? We're we're good at invading and you know trying to get other things. Why don't we Why don't we just like take some good ideas and bring them back to the U.S.? So, so I've probably been thinking about this for a very long time, and uh, um, and finally uh, this year I decided to to do it, and um, and uh, so I called up some friends that had made those films with me and. Um, so why don't we why don't we go shoot this movie and let's just see what we find. So why does this come now versus you know your first film? What was what was the difference between oh now I got to do it? Why? Uh, because I think we're I think we're in a in a, in a fairly perilous m time in a, in a moment here where things are going to shift one way or the other, and I think that they've been moving somewhat in a good direction lately, but. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to explain this because, okay, let's go back to 1999. I'm directing a video for Rage Against the Machine uh, down on Wall Street. And, um, and so we're, we're going to run over and we're going to try and you know, break into the stock exchange. Essentially, that's the conceit of the video. And, um, and so we, we needed like stockbroker types and hedge fund guys. And um, so we had this, this crowd of extras. And I'm thinking, there's, they need to be holding signs or something. So I went over to the art person. I said, here, make up a sign that says this. And she goes and she gives it to the guy. And this is 1999. And the sign says, Trump for president. Right. And not saying it was my idea. It's a subliminal lesson. <laughs> well, I just thought, what would be the craziest thing <laughs> that I could come up with? Uh, so, but now it's not so funny anymore. <laughs> now it's real. Now he's going to be the Republican nominee for president of the United States. And it's like, oh, see the, did you see the, his rally in Massachusetts last night? Huge. It was like a football stadium of people. It was, it was, it was, it was America uber alles. It was, it was really, um, wow. Now, I don't believe he can win. But um, I, I, I don't think anybody should take him for granted. Uh, yeah, well, I think people have been, and the whole time. I mean, yeah, just, me too. It's, yeah. Yeah, and it would start off as a joke. Now it's like, oh, crap. But like, people are following him. So it seems like no matter what he says, too, and not to get uh, off complete topic, but no matter what he says, it just seems to be like, oh, oh I just said it. And they just goes on. So how is that working for him? In a way? It works well. well. One thing that people do like about him is that he doesn't think before he talks which is like most of us. Yeah. 
<laughs> so he seems kind of real in that way where he just says whatever's on his mind and it feels refreshing because we're so used to the political speak. And, and he's, he's, he too is interested in it and he's saying things he doesn't believe in. <clears throat> so at the beginning of this year, I thought, well, this is just really good performance art. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you've lived in New York for any period of time or if you are a native uh, New Yorker, you know, you know Trump. And you know that he um, you know, has funded uh, 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 all these different campaigns and groups for gay marriage, for uh, pro-choice, for uh, 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 guns. I mean, the whole, I mean, he's been very liberal on all the, all the issues through most of his, his, his life. He's very pro-union, at least the private sector unions. Uh, he wants to raise the min minimum wage. He's always been for that. He's always been for a, and, and, he, and I think he's still for, a one-time tax on the rich of 14%, where they literally would have to pay 14% of what they own <laughs> right now. But this would, in his mind, retire the, the debt. He's for single-payer health care, not, not for the right reasons, but because I don't like dealing with those 50, those 50 state insurance commissioners, red tape everywhere. You know, it's Great like, impression. We, just need, we just need one. One insurance commissioner, single pair, and uh, you know it's like, it's like, uh, so so on that level, you know that he's faking it, and his time on television, sort of blurred the line in his own mind between reality and 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 TV or performance, and and now and he's now he sees it works for him, he sees by being a demagogue by being a by being a racist, by being uh, kind of proto-fascist, uh, that there's always a crowd for that. And history has proven there's always been a crowd for that. <laughs> and so, but the, but, but the good news is, is that 81% of the people of this country are either women, people of color, or adults between the ages of 18 and 35. That's 81% of America. That's not the America he sees. He thinks they're all guys that look like him. But the white guys over 35 are 19% of the population. So, so he's speaking to a very small group. And the reason he shouldn't and can't win is because the majority of the country are dames or broads, uh, people he wants to build a wall around, <laughs> or people your age who probably don't find him too cool. And I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm not, I mean, I haven't surveyed everybody in here, but I'm just guessing that when you think of somebody representing you to the rest of the world, the image of Trump doesn't come into your mind. Um, but, but we are also the slacker side of the political arena, our side of the fence, my side of the fence. You know, the other side, you know, they're going to be up on election morning at 6 in the morning. They're going to vote. Right. Right. The only reason we'd be up at 6 in the morning is if we'd partied all night. You know, <laughs> so it's like, you know, right. It's, right. So it's like, so... So if enough people don't get involved, if the, if the Democratic candidate isn't inspiring, yeah. doesn't create the enthusiasm that Obama did, you know, is just kind of zzz, like that, um, and just talks like a politician, enough people may stay home. Certainly enough young people may stay home, and enough people of color may stay home. And that's really something to think about. It's why in all those polls, what's interesting is that Hillary is ahead of uh, Bernie, um, you know, in the, in the main number, but when you pit them against Trump, in the recent polls, Bernie has come out a point or two ahead when it's Hillary versus Trump or Bernie versus Trump. So it's something to, it's something to think about. I know this has nothing to do with this movie. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, come But on. how did we get on that? Uh, no, not you. It was it because um, you called me a documentarian? I think that yes. was it. <laughs> and uh, so, but no, so, I mean, but, but I can kind of tie this into segue into uh, social media because you kind of you very yeah. very much embraced that with Twitter you did that stint at Trump Tower with we are all uh, Muslim and so you fully embraced social media how has that kind of changed you and given yourself another voice in this medium uh, kind of you didn't really grow up with it but now you have it as a as a platform oh I know but as soon as it came I was the, I, I had a TV show in uh, 1993 ni to 95 called TV Nation it was on uh, NBC and then it was on Fox. Uh, good Fox, Simpsons Fox, not mm -hmm. not Fox News, um, but uh, the um, but it. I was the first uh, primetime television show to actually have at the in the credits at the end of the show www dot an actual website. Uh -huh. 
Nobody had ever done that before. And they were like, the network was like, why do you want to put that in there? I said, because this is really, this is, this is 993 now, right? Uh -oh. So it's, it's not really, a, it's not a thing uh, yet. But I, I immediately saw uh, social media as, as the smasher of the wall between the people and, and the rest of the people. There's, there's, always, there's always been a wall where if, if we wanted to communicate to each other, how would we do that? You know, I, I remember something I didn't like that was written in the New Yorker magazine. And my only option, as it was for like, a, if you read something in the paper or whatever, was to write a letter to the editor. Maybe they would publish it. Maybe not in its original form. I wrote this to the New Yorker, and they wrote back and they said, well, they, we don't have letters to the editor. And I thought, wow. So they just published something about my hometown of Flint, Michigan that wasn't true. And I have no means to correct the record. In a, in, a, in a valued and, and, and sophisticated publication like The New Yorker. And <clears throat> I just, I thought, way, this is way back then, God, I wish there was some way where I could leap over the gatekeeper and just let everybody know, actually, here's the truth. The fact that, that social media has allowed us to talk to each other, that, it can, that we can't be regulated or stopped from doing that, and that, and that those in power can't they can get away with things still, and they certainly try, but it's a lot harder for them. Witness the police who simply cannot just, you know, randomly get away with now. It makes you wonder how many other innocent people, and by people, I, that's a euphemism for black and Hispanic people, but people, black and Hispanic people who have been, who have been killed by the police, and we never knew that. That's just one example of how, of how the democratization and the, and the sort of um, egalitarianism of social media and that, and that it doesn't matter that if I'm, I'm a filmmaker or I, you know, I'm with Warner Brothers or whatever, that you can talk to me. You can, you can send me an email tonight. You can, uh, you can tweet at me. You can go on my Facebook page. And I go there and I read it. And, and I will randomly write back uh, to people. I mean, I, I mean I, obviously, I can't write to the thousand that may see this and, and uh, write me. But I, I do what I can do. But I certainly, I certainly get a sense of what people are saying. I never would have got that sense before. So this is such a, a great era. And, and I don't think, I mean, a lot of people my age, and I, I can't believe there's still people, boom, baby boomers and the such, who are, are still like, like this. <laughs> You know, toward it's like, oh my God, you're going to end up like both of my grandmothers never learned how to drive a car. Right. They thought the horse was going to come back. I mean, they, <laughs> <clears throat> I'm like, yo, you're so crazy to stay away from this. And and then they and then they point out the things that bother them. <clears throat> like I came in here and I counted five people that were on their devices while my movie was going on, and I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. But then I'm I'm like, but you know, but that's but I'd rather deal with that than not have this. And, and, and who knows how many lives that those five were saving in here. No, 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 but it's, 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 um, um, it, 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 it's, it's a good thing. And it's, and, and we can't even imagine now. I remember I was at the 2004 Democratic Convention and Jimmy Carter, I, I was just there kind of, I was covering it actually for a paper, and um, it was after Fahrenheit 9-11 came out, and he asked if I would like to sit in the presidential box with him on the night he was gonna give his speech, and I was like, wow, yes, thank you. And, um, <clears throat> and in the box were a, a, a two or, yeah, two of the, what, three, the founders, the, the people that, you know, the, the you know, started this, and uh, and uh, they were. It, it was. It was like I, I just remember. I still remember this moment because Google in 2004 was how many? How, how many years old? Two years old? Uh, like five, six, maybe six. Maybe. Five, yeah, but I mean, okay, yes, but yeah, yes, the yeah, incorporation yeah, papers were filed, and people started working. But the on hype it. around Google. But I'm turning. In, I mean, in sense, in the sense that it that everybody was using it. That was the early. That was the infancy. Right of, of Google, and I just remember thinking, 
this is such a great moment. And I was thinking as I was standing up here with everybody, we don't even know 10 years from now what is going to be invented or how, uh, what better ways we're going to have to talk to each other, reach each other. I think it's revolutionary. I think that this can create um, uh, movements. It can involve people more in their democracy. It has so many good things about it. And the bad things about it are, 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 are regulated by other people. So if you put out something out there that's not true, there's going to be a 1,000 people on you to correct the lie that you're telling. You know? Right. And yeah. so, well, you know, it's, it's, so that's interesting, though, because I think with this film, you did it very much in secret. So you kind of you shut off social media. You didn't let a publicist come on with you. And no. it was very much done in secret. So no press that... release was sent out when we did the deal. Right. So and, what, and why we, was and that? We, and we, did, we, we didn't disconnect. We, I didn't disconnect from social media in terms of politics or news or things that were going on. Were doing. But, but I wasn't going to discuss what I was doing. Uh, certainly, the one thing you learn, how many times do you have to be burned on Google <laughs> to know there are just so, so many things you want to share? Right. So, so that was an easy one uh, to do. But we knew we would tweet about this, and we would put this up, and we'd Instagram it when we were done. But uh, what was interesting is that we were able to get away with it. That, um, And I don't know in 10 years we would be, 10 years from now, that we'll be able to get away with it. Part of it's a language issue. Maybe somebody saw me in Slovenia and, and tweeted in Slovenian. <laughs> but you were then. But you know, there's not a lot out there yet for people to kind of, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the mechanisms exist to translate that. But it's, it's, I'm, I'm more concerned with the fact that we would be the top story on the evening news in, in Italy or, or France or whatever because they, were, they would see me filming. And so the camera crews would come out, oh. interview me. But you know, it would be. It would, you know, the whole broadcast was in Italian or Slovenian. And because the networks no longer have these foreign bureaus, you know, if they're, if they're, if they're maybe a big, one of the big three networks or the New York Times, they've got somebody in London, they've got somebody in Tokyo. But in the old days, guys, in my time, man, there was somebody in Paris, Madrid, uh, Rome, Warsaw. I mean, it was everywhere. And now, and now corporate media, that doesn't exist. So... Right, and so in, in where to invade next? You visit Italy, France, Finland, Germany, Slovenia, not Slovakia, Portugal, Tunisia, Norway, and Iceland. Um, so how did you choose which countries would be included, and were there any that you did film or you thought about doing and then just pulled away? Yes, um, we we filmed three countries that we didn't put in the film, okay. um, mainly because I don't think movies should be longer than two hours. Um, I think most movies are too long. Anyways, don't you agree? And if they are longer than two hours, then they should really earn it. <laughs> like, right? right. Um, so I didn't mind Star Wars you know, being longer than two hours. <laughs> so, um, but I, uh, uh, we went to Canada, we went to Austria, and we went also to Estonia. Okay. And Estonia, because they, uh, they have the best mother mortality rate, li li uh, the le least number of mothers die in childbirth in, Slo in um, uh, Estonia than any other country. Austria has lowered the voting age to 16, as have a dozen or half a dozen other countries. And they found that 18 to 30 year olds vote at a higher percentage when you get them starting to vote in high school. Um, I think that's a really, really good idea, especially if they're going to be fighting in a war, God forbid, ever again in this country. But you know, there are a lot of things you're going to have to start doing at 18. And maybe in the couple years leading up to that, you should have a say in what's going to happen to you at 18. And a lot of 16-year-olds are not mature enough. They won't bother. They won't vote. But the ones who are engaged, why not have their, why not give them a say in their early adulthood? Right. Um, and it, I mean, there's so much interesting stuff in here. But your goal was, I mean, it paints a very, very good picture of each of these countries too. And you had said, you know, it was not to present a complete portrait of each of the countries, but to kind of pick out things that they do well and not focus on any of the negative. And none of it was actually shot in the U.S. You didn't. No, every, every we wanted to make a film about the U.S., but not shoot a single frame of film in the U.S. <laughs> that was that was kind of our challenge at the beginning. Could that be possible? And uh, and tell the story of America by going to these other countries. And I wasn't, and I only wanted to take the good, why would I want to take a bad thing? You know, I don't go to buy a new car and buy a clunker. You know, I want to get a car that works. So I don't want, I don't want any of the, the all these countries have things that don't work. Right. 
Um, but that's not my mission. My mission was go take the things that work really well and bring them here because I think most of those things could work here. Some of them will be, will be harder <clears throat> because we haven't dealt with our, our racial question yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but some of those things, we could stop poisoning kids during the lunch hour tomorrow. You know, the, yeah. every parent that sees this film can go to the PTA meeting next week and say, hey, you know what, why don't we, why don't we do this differently? They do this in France differently and it costs less. Right. Well, and, and I mean, that's, that's one of the, the great scenes. It was the second country you visit, which was France, which is basically going into these uh, children's elementary school and seeing what they serve for lunch, which are basically these gourmet meals, these four-course meals with cheese and, and lamb skewers and all that, and just uh, amazing, amazing stuff. And they meet, so the sh head chef of the school will meet with uh, school officials. He has to answer to the mayor and the school officials and the, the town. Dietitian. Right, and the dietitian. And the dietitian. And so uh, what I loved about that Can you was imagine if the... If the, the, the people that fed us, especially if you went to public school, <coughs> the people that fed us at lunch were had to answer to a dietitian, <laughs> it would be like a firing squad. <laughs> right. Like, right. And, you know, Michelle Obama tried to start that, but it kind of yeah. got some pushback and wasn't really working. And so why didn't that work? That kind of seems like the country is moving more towards, at least it seems like a little bit more of the healthy stuff. With yeah. The, with well, with us, you have to do it differently. Okay. I think you have to, you have to do it health, health-wise, but you call it pizza. No matter, no matter what you make or what you feed them a day, don't call it lamb skewers, just call it pizza. And I, I just think if we just rename everything pizza, but then make it really good and tasty, all right? Tasty. It does have to taste good. But it can taste good and still be, and still be healthy. Um, they, they, these, but it's funny with these kids because they don't drink Coke. Mm -hmm. You know, they, first of all, they, they looked at it like it was poison. <laughs> then finally, the little girl next to me, right? I hope I didn't bully her too much. <laughs> it was hilarious. I know. Every time I watch that scene, I want to call Child Protective Services on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I keep pushing the glass. Drink and then it. she tries it. And within 15 seconds, you know, her, she's like this with her fork. <laughs> and it's like, because she's, I'm thinking, she, here's, she's never had this. Now she's taken too big of a gulp and literally has mainlined it. Right into our system. <laughs> it was just, a, it was a, it's a sad, sad scene. Well, it's, 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 it's <laughs> I'm embarrassed. It's, I'm like, there, there's just some great scenes and some great interesting things that you pulled from each country. Um, like in Italy, how much vacation they get. I think it was something like 30 to 35 days of paid vacation. Yep. Plus another week of national holiday. Yep. 15 days of paid holiday after getting married. Yep. 13 months salary in December. Just here's a month salary. Just here it is for you. Yeah, because what's the use of having a vacation if you can't pay for it? Right. right? I mean, most people live from paycheck to paycheck. So what if they gave you four weeks off? Well, fine, but I got to pay my mortgage that month. I got to pay the car payment. I got to pay the school. I got to pay, you know, how am I going to pay? Uh, am I going to go anywhere? So they, they, they worked that into the system. Right, and it was interesting because you talked about, uh, well, you kind of were pressing them a little bit on the American dream and like, oh, well, if you come to America, you only get zero. You get zero unless you go to an employer who actually yeah. pay for it and stuff. And they were like, oh. So the American dream kind of a little bit changed for them where they were like, I don't know if I want to go. Right, well, they know, they think they all know America a lot by the movies and, mm -hmm. you know, it looked, we look good in the movies generally. Mm -hmm. So I think they go, in France, the day that, let's say you're going to move, you got a new apartment, you're going to move from Queens to Brooklyn, that's a step up, right? right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Michigan, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, uh, the day you move from Queens to Brooklyn, if you were in France, that's a paid day off by law. Hmm. You should not have to miss your pay because you got to move. So if you got to move tomorrow, then uh, you shouldn't have to lose any money because you had to move. I mean, that just it's just little things like that. You just go, wow, that's kind of humane. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, it, it, what was interesting in a lot of it, I mean, there's a ton of interesting things in here, but some of these were actually American ideas, and they brought that up a few times in it where it was like in Finland with, um, you know, uh, free tuition and, and only three to four hours of school a day with a lunch hour and getting rid of standardized tests that we have here in America and um, you know and there's no good or bad schools there just the rich kids are mixed in with the poor kids and the middle class and, and everyone goes to school together and it's actually illegal to actually charge tuition so you know with the, some of these it's illegal to charge tuition can you right. believe that that's crazy yeah even for college I said don't you mean you don't have a Harvard and the Minister of Education she says we have 19 Harvards <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> right, in, in like the Norwegian um, uh, prison. So, you know, how they treat their, their prisoners. Like humans. Like humans. And, and they have to treat them because there's no life pr sentence and there's no capital punishment. So they get a lecture from the warden on day one. It says, because we don't have these two things that America has, that means you may be my neighbor someday. You may be living on my street. So it's in my best interest for that when you leave here, that you leave here a better person and not inclined to commit crime. So it's, so it's not just because the Norwegians are better than us. They have a, there's a self-interest involved mm -hmm. in wanting to live in a safer society. Well, and they're very free there. I mean, for you guys who saw the film, it's, it's crazy because it's, it's almost like a resort where they go to, and it's very free and open. They can swim across a lake. They can swim one way. They can't swim. They in don't the want prison. To swim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. right. And it's, it's very open. They have the keys to their own doors. And you even went, the cool thing was, I was like, oh, this has this got to be fake. But then you went to the maximum security prison, and I was like, oh, that was interesting. Because that was even free, too. It was a little bit more protected or yeah. guarded, but... It was very, very um, open and free, and they had TV and they had internet, and it was it was just crazy. But again, he said this was um, one of the what the guards was saying that it was you know this is an American idea where it was basically no cruel you know punishment towards the prisoners and stuff. So where do we, where where did we lose our way? Or where did we lose our where, way? Where are they getting that actually? Because America obviously hasn't done that for years. So where are they getting this from? Is it just from the past or or? Well, the world for a very long time has loved the United States of America and has looked up to us. And, and they, they know that there's, some, there's a certain thing about us and our, our ingenuity and our sort of motivation and, our, and we're kind of all like this, you know, and they're very much playing it close to the chest. And, and they know that, you know, Bel Belgium isn't going to invent the iPhone. You know, no offense to Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, Google isn't going to come out of Hungary. No offense to Hungary. Mm -hmm. But there is something unique about us that, um, that historically we've been this sort of, um, and part of it is, is, the, is the classless society that we've always tried to say we are, or try to be. Um, but <clears throat> I think that there's so many good things about us that they admire and they bought a lot of it. And we decided to start unbuying it. Uh, we had an education system that was the uh, envy of the world. Now nobody would want our education system. Nobody. Nobody would come here to study it. So they just took all the great progressive, philosophical, American education ideas and just implemented them. Um, in Germany and Japan and Italy, the Axis powers during World War II, after the war, after they were defeated, President Roosevelt, he had just passed away, uh, um, but he had set it up so that when the war ended, um, his, his team from his administration would go and write their new constitutions. So in the new constitutions for Germany and Italy and Japan, they had universal health care. They had labor rights. They had, you know, uh, a college and education being a free and progressive system. So they instituted a lot of the things we didn't have even then. The, the part of our past that, we're, that we shouldn't be proud of in terms of how our racial issue, um, how we've treated our native people, um, how we've allowed capitalism to morph itself into an ugly system of greed and, and making sure that only the very, very, very top get all the, the wealth and everybody else scrambles for the crumbs. Um, you know, that's, there's nothing to look back and be proud of in that part of our history. So it's kind of a, it's, it's, I feel bad that we've lost our way in that sense. I mean, I want to know, I mean, looking at you in this room, I was just trying to add up the total amount of student loan debt uh, in this room. I'm sure it's in the millions. Um, but my generation, your parents, um, we went to school for free or nearly free, depending on where you lived. You know, if you went to, if your parents went to Brooklyn College, they paid thirty-five dollars a semester. If they went to UC Berkeley, they went for free. If they went to SUNY Buffalo, they went for free. Uh, if they went to Ann Arbor, I don't know, they paid five hundred bucks. It was nothing. Right. Why did we allow a system to come into being? that then sent you as 22-year-olds out into the world as debtors, as in a debtor's prison, as I said in the film. 
Well, why would we do that to our own kids? Why did we let that happen? Why did we let the banks and the whole system allow? Why did we, why did we not give you what we had? Well, how, how do you how do you change that? How do you go back? Like you like it seems like we're too deep in. It does seem that way, right. and, it, and I know, and some of it seems a little hopeless. I well, <clears throat> there's many examples I can give where it seemed hopeless, and eventually women could vote. You know, it seemed hopeless, and eventually, I mean, hopeless was. Going back to 04, the election, when 14 states made it part of the Constitution to make it illegal to marry the person you're in love with if they happen to be a, of the same gender. Here we are 11 years later, gone. It's like, wow, you know, like I said in the film, it's okay, the impossible can happen. Because right. this was a country bigoted against gay and lesbian people. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't illegal to be in love. And if that can happen, I just, I think practically anything can happen. And, I, and there are some good groups that can show how we can go back to free college education, at least for the state schools. Will we ever have a system where uh, there won't be private schools and you can't charge for tuition? I would probably doubt that. But we can certainly make the, our state institutions to be um, either very affordable or free uh, for all the students. And it wouldn't cost that much more money uh, to do that. We spend $750 billion on defense. You know, if we just cut that back by a third, that money could be used for so many good things. Why don't we have a bullet train from New York to LA? We, are, we and the Brits invented the train. Why does Taiwan have a bullet train? Go Google the map of Taiwan right now. <laughs> <laughs> on the northern, if you went from the east coast to the west coast of northern Taiwan, you could walk it in a day. They don't need a bullet train. They have a bullet train. We have 3,000 miles. We need a bullet train. You know, we can afford that if we wanted to do that. Why don't we have that? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, we used to be the innovators. We used to do this. I was telling the, uh, my, some of my crew, we came in here today. I said, you know, this building has a very important history. You guys all know the history of this building, right? Uh, for those of you who are watching or listening elsewhere, we're in the original Port Authority building here uh, that goes between 9th Avenue and 8th Avenue and 15th and 16th Street. <clears throat> By the way, those are not, I'm not giving coordinates out to the Trump campaign <laughs> to <laughs> fire, fire any missiles at this moment. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but the original cable that was laid under the Atlantic Ocean, the first cable that, to bring the tele first the telegraph and then the telephone line came up out of the Atlantic Ocean and under and up into this building. And from here, whatever the call or the telegraph was or whatever emanated from this building, then out to wherever across North America. That that's that's an amazing thing when you think back to it. And you know, you've probably you've read, read the book Tubes about you know the internet. Remember the Republican senator who was yeah, it's a bunch of damn tubes. <laughs> but then this journalist thought, well, you know, actually there are a lot of tubes involved yeah. here. And, the, and sort of the sweet irony that Google now inhabits this building, that the virtual tube that we're all connected to um, in a so much better and easier way than trying to bring a call or a telegraph in from the right. Atlantic Ocean, that you're in this building. I think it's, it's very cool. Uh, we'll start taking audience questions if you guys want to start lining up the mic. Um, but you know, one of one of the things that when we were sitting here watching the film, one of the things that got the biggest laugh and got the biggest chuckle out of me was the because we all know it too well, which is in Germany where they have basically when the work is over, it's over, and they don't bring it home with them, and it's against the law to contact an employee while they're on vacation. And many companies have adopted the rule that companies can't send any emails after work hours, such as Mercedes, where they actually have computers that block the emails sent by bosses to their reports. Were those, was that laughter you heard, or <laughs> wails and moans and, <laughs> and cries? It was, just, it was so interesting, because I, mean, I mean, they've changed the entire way they even work, and they're really, the countries are caring about their people more, right? Um, versus just trying to make a buck, or whatever the case may be. Right, social media should not be used to abuse employees. Social media is there to help us mm -hmm. be better people in a better world, not for an employer to have a tether on you until midnight. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, and I just think that just seems like common sense, decent um, you know, behavior. And it's your choice. If you want to do that, you know, do that. I mean, if you're, you, the employee, want to work, uh, you know, but again, it's, you need to also take some time for yourself and you need to not work at some point. Yeah. I, let me, can I ask you just then? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I, but, because this is an interesting question because, like, the, the, uh, the maternity leave, the paid, mm -hmm. you guys, I'm sure I've read, you know, you and, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, uh Facebook and a lot of the social media, uh, giants have really good, uh, uh, plans in terms of if you're going to have a baby or, or um, you know, how much time you can take off. And in fact, some, I don't know who it is, uh, somebody just, you can have unlimited time. Um, Netflix, yeah. Netflix. Netflix does it. It's like, can that be, are like, are they, are they shitting me or when they, <laughs> are, are they like, or because I can imagine that would just make it worse. Because then at Netflix, you don't know when or how much you can take off, or how, how, much, how much are they gonna hate me, or the boss is gonna, I'm gonna get the worst job when I come back, or I'm like, you know, is that an issue? Like, even in a place here where you have to think about? I think in general, just in America, I think it's just any company that I've been at where it's just, you do feel that pressure where it's like, oh, I do wanna take two weeks after I get married, or I wanna take um, a week here, or a week there. Like, but it is very much in terms of American culture, just, disconnecting in general and just trying to break away and not feel guilty for doing that sometimes. So right. enough about me. You? <laughs> hey, Michael. Hi there. Um, so I think, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think a lot of us would agree that America has some of the best like innovations, especially in the tech sector, um, you know, in the whole world. Um, so I was wondering if you thought that if America was to adopt some of the policies like in Europe, if you think that that would stifle some of the innovations that are coming out of America? No, and in fact, I just said, you know, what I just said, I, I, I do believe that's one of the things that's really great about us. What, what it, when you say stifle, like you mean the vacation thing or the, or what, like what, what do they have that would stifle us here? I'm not sure exactly, but I know I've looked around at, you know, Europe just doesn't have, if you look at like tech startups, there's not that many in Europe and I can, sure some of it might be that like, it's already established in the U.S., but I imagine that it might just be a little bit harder and more expensive to start a business there. Yeah, well, that now that I don't know about, but I think that just imagine though, if you had, if you actually had a, a few weeks to not have to worry about work, how many people in this room had had an idea that if you just had a little time to explore the idea or investigate it, to noodle with it, to go into whatever your version of the workshop is for you? What great ideas or inventions are we not getting? Because you're, there's so much pressure on you to be a certain way and to work a certain way that doesn't allow that to come out. That's what I would, I'm more concerned about, about that. And I think that if we, if we were a little more European, just chilled a little more, the creativity in us, and I don't mean just inventing the next tech thing. There is somebody in here that probably, has got a great novel in them, and or a screenplay or a movie they'd like to, or I, you know, whatever. Maybe you should, maybe there's just a great poem that needs to be written in this room. Uh, you know, are you allowing yourself to have the time to do that and the freedom to do that, and are you having the chill to do that? I I I, I, um, I guess I'm more concerned about that. If when you hear that they have more regulations there, there's a reason they do on some level, and that's because. They don't want you to eat bad meat, and they they want to make sure the products are are right, and you know they have they're strict about certain things because they care about the people. So they're really they're concerned about that. They don't want polluters polluting, things like that. So, but about the small businesses and all that, I don't know much about. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, am I allowed to ask a question about Donald Trump, or is it just moving forward? <laughs> you are not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> this is America. <laughs> No, of course you can ask me. Okay. Ask me anything you want. Um, I had a moment that you as a filmmaker might relate to. I was, <clears throat> for holidays I was in Europe and I was at a show and I was so enjoying and then I had all of a sudden this moment of, this feels very much like the beginning of a second World War movie that shows Europe before the war, that everybody is just enjoying the culture, people are participating in opera and concert and everything and all of a sudden the you know, generals are called into an emergency meeting and a war is breaking out. 
Um, my point is, why are we so comfortable with believing Trump has no chance? What has, have we as the world learned after Second World War that we are so confident another fascist government is not gonna come to power? Another person like Hitler um, who started all these ideas by bullying a minority group or religious group um, is not gonna happen again. Like, nothing has seriously happened and we are still very strongly believing Donald Trump doesn't have a chance. And I have been hearing that yeah. for the last six months and now he's yeah. solidly leading the GOP. No. The reason people think that he doesn't have a chance, and I think you're okay to think that he doesn't have a chance, is because everybody knows the America we live in now. And it's not angry white guys like Donald Trump. It is the people I, I, I said. Women generally aren't going to vote for Trump. He's, he's guaranteed that. People of color, uh, are not going to vote. You can look at all the polls. I mean, I saw one poll where Hispanics, it wasn't even 0%. It was like a neg it was a negative number. And I couldn't, how do you get a negative number in a poll? So it's, it's and, then, and, then, and then young people, you were the, the one good thing baby boomers and the, and the next generation did in terms of who your parents are is I think that we raised a generation of people who don't hate. You're not, a, you're not haters. You don't hate people because of their skin color. You don't hate people because of who they are in love with. And, and we raised you. And so it's, it's, it's very hard for uh, the, 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 the proto-fascist types to take charge. It's like, you know, if women were voting, would they vote for Hitler? If, if black people and Hispanics voted in mass, would they vote for Hitler? I mean, not to use Hitler as the, I only use it because you use that example, but I'm just saying that that, that it's nothing to be afraid of, but we should be conscious of it, and we should no longer treat him as a joke. He should be taken seriously and, and, and dealt with. Um, and so I tweeted out yesterday when he, when he said that about Bill Clinton was an abuser of women. Well, actually, Bill Clinton um, gave us the Family Leave Act. So we don't have paid maternity leave, but we have maternity leave now. You can take so many weeks off, thanks to Bill Clinton. He was pro-choice. Um, he had consensual sex with an adult. Um, and none of our business, frankly. And then I just hashtag uh, Trump, Trump's three wives. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not that it, there's anything wrong with having three wives. Sometimes the third one is a charm, and I, I make... <laughs> I make no judgment about that. I'm just saying, I was just my way of putting it out there. I'd love to hear from them, yeah. you know, um, because this guy can't get away with can't get away with that. Shouldn't get away with that. And I'm not, I'm not a Hillary. I haven't endorsed anybody for president. I'm just saying though that that if he's going to go down that road, people have got to stand up against us and not be bull not be bullied. <coughs> yes, thank you. Hi. Uh, so. Growing up in Australia, uh, I always felt... I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm here now, right? You're here. Um, I always felt strong cultural, social, economic connections to the US. There's a lot of similarities. Uh, I think there's, there's the same with a lot of European countries, with, with Canada. Um, but I remember watching Bowling for Columbine when I was, what, 11 or 12 or something, and thinking, what the hell is wrong with this country? What's so... In, in this movie as well, you, you've laid out a lot of the differences and a lot of the things that the US does differently to these other countries. Um, and we, we can all see those differences around us, education, healthcare, um, guns. What, why is it that the US is so different? There's, there's so much history, cultural, economic connection. What do you think the reasons are for these differences? Partly what I said in the film, because we haven't, we haven't been able to deal with our two original sins, that we were founded on genocide and we were built on the backs of slaves. We don't acknowledge it, and we haven't fixed it. As a re and so until we, you got to take care of that first problem, I think, before you can move on and be a better people. So Canada and Australia also had serious problems with <clears throat> that too, right? Uh, you, well, yes, but nothing like us. Nothing at all like us. Canada did not have a slave system like us. And Britain and Canada ended slavery uh, before we did. And, and made reparations. The Canadians have continued to make reparations to their native people. In fact, they gave them a whole province that they can autonomously run 
I can't imagine us doing that for Native Americans or, or you know, even as I show, almost 40% of Mississippi is black. And they have, and, and what they get for that, what they get for being 40% of the state are the most conservative redneck representatives in Congress. It makes absolutely no sense until you start to think about, well, how do you suppress the vote of 40, if 40% 40 of the state's black, how do you get the most conservative white people to represent the state? I think, I think that, that, that um, um, a lot of our problem is, is to do with fear. Um, we, we're easily manipulated with fear. Um, it's why we have so many guns, I think, in people's homes. I mean, why would you have a gun in the house? You're afraid of something, right? You might need it for protection. Protection against whom? Little old freckle-faced Jimmy down the street? I don't think so. I don't think you're worried about Jimmy. What are you worried about? Why are 90% of the guns in homes or in suburbs and rural areas, not in the city? Why don't we have any mass shootings at our city high schools? Right? Doesn't happen, does it? You know, so I think that, that there's a lot that, I mean, I could, there's a much longer answer to that, but I think that there's, there are things unique about us. And I, President Obama, you probably didn't see him today with his, did you guys see it? Uh, his press conference on guns and what he's going to do. He broke down and cried. I've never, I've, I mean, he's had tears before, but I've never seen him. He actually cried, and he couldn't stop the tears. He tried to stop them, and they wouldn't stop. Once he started, once he, he mentioned the, the 26-year-olds that were shot, 21st graders shot at Newtown, and he couldn't get the thought out of his head, and he couldn't, the tears couldn't stop coming down his face. You'll, you'll see it later when you look it up. But. Yeah, it's, it was, that was crazy. I did see that this morning, and actually, do you think the president's executive action would, is it going to change anything? You no. You think nothing? No. No. But his heart's in the right place. He's a compassionate person. Um, he doesn't really have the power that he needs to have to fix this. But the biggest problem isn't the fact that, you know, they have guns in Canada. And they, don't, they don't shoot each other like we do. Um, and they have guns in lots of countries. Um, Israel's a good example. There's lots of guns in Israel. But they don't go into the high schools and shoot them up. They don't shoot each other. There's something very unique. And he said during the talk today, he says, I don't think Americans are any more violent than other people. Actually, we are. We are more violent. We're violent collectively by the way we invade countries, the way we drone bomb civilians. The things that we do um, are shameful. And personally, the way we resolve our differences. Remember, 70%, I think 60 to 70% of all murders are between people who know each other. It's not a stranger killing you. It's, it's somebody you're resolving a dispute with or somebody you're mad at, and you reach for the gun. That's how most of our murders you know, take place. So um, I'll give shorter answers so you can get more people. No, 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 no for no. sure. But really quickly, um, would you ever revisit something in a film like you did with Bowling for Cobb by now knowing where the country has gone with gun protection? No, but sadly, Bowling for Cobb might could open this Friday and be every bit as relevant as it was in 2002. That's a sad statement to me. The only thing I would change about Bowling for Columbine is I would mention that we're safe from 51% of the population. Women don't do this. San Bernardino aside, that's a, an incident that hasn't been explained yet, so I'll wait on that. But women don't do mass shootings. Women uh, don't go into high schools and spray bullets. Um, when you're walking home on 8th Avenue here tonight, it's dark. Your radar's up a little bit because it's dark. You're in a big city. What are you afraid of? The image in your mind is not a woman jumping out of the bushes to assault you. Okay. It's a guy. So let's just say what it is. We are, the, the, the unsafe factor comes from the 49% of the population. So, so I would have I would put a little happy news in Bowling for Columbine to say that we're actually safe from the majority of Americans. <laughs> the majority of Americans generally, generally are not going to kill you or harm you in that way. Go women. Unless you're cheating or... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Michael, thank you for the film. It was uh, yes. inspiring. Um, what do you, when you make a film, and, and I guess, you know, thinking about your portfolio of films, what do you want those films to do? I mean, in terms of in yeah. affecting change. Sure. Uh, is it to start a dialogue? Is it to... The first thing I want to do is for you to have felt that you just spent a good, these two hours, it was a good way to spend those two hours. That I'm, I'm a filmmaker, so I, you go to the movies, I want you to have a good time at the movies. 
I want you to, I want you to walk up the aisle going, damn, that was good. That, seriously, that is, is, every filmmaker wants that first and foremost, that at the very least you were entertained. And entertainment can mean it could, that it was thought provoking, uh, but you laughed maybe, maybe you cried, um, maybe you got mad. Any of those things, uh, I'm happy with, with all of that. If 10% of the audience commits themselves to doing something about this, that would be huge. Um, I don't expect that from everybody, and I don't demand it. I really, I really want you to, I want you to have a good time at the movies, and so I make movies for you to take a date to on a Friday night. You know, I, <laughs> serious. I have a sign in the edit room that, that says, "Remember, people want to go home and have sex after watching this movie." <laughs> so, so it's like. Don't mess it up for them. <laughs> you know? <it's laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God, <laughs> Earlier in this interview, you were mentioning the influence of like social media and how it allows things to be a little bit more de democratic, get more feedback. But at the same time, over the years, we've seen a decline in like public interviews that everyone could see. Like in 1993, for example, you had a Larry King live interview between Ross Perot and... and Vice President um, Al Gore about NAFTA, but with things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership much bigger in scope, we've had no public debate or discussion. So my question is, like, is there a risk of social media being a self-selection kind of filter where you only get the information you want to hear and everything else is out? That's a great question, yes. And I think, in part, the good news, like this year, look at the TV ratings for the debates. They're through the roof. They're higher than they've ever been because there's so few moments like that where there aren't those kind of shows where you have this live interaction, unedited, unsupervised, and just go at it. And, and I, think that that's, I, think that's really, I think that's a really good point. When I, you know, when I said that about social media, I mean, I, I think it's like she said in the film. Are you using it to watch the Kardashians? Or are you using it for all the good that it, it could do for you? I mean, to test my theory, I had been walking around my neighborhood about political topics and making comics and flyers and just talking to people, and everyone tells me I'm just wasting my time and I should be going on social media instead. Oh, no, I don't. No, 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 because, because social media can also just be noise. There's so much noise. What you're doing, having that personal human interaction, we're social beings. It's, it's why nothing has killed the movies. The movie theaters won't go away. The way record stores and video stores went away, Theaters won't go away. That's because people want to be with other people. It's why restaurants will never go away. Nobody says, well, how do the restaurants survive? Everybody's got a kitchen in their home now. <laughs> well, <laughs> because they like to go out. And they like to be around strangers and eat in front of strangers. That's who we are as humans. And we want to sit in a dark room with 200 other people. You know, you can't, you can't. The video store, that was, you were taking that home to watch, sometimes by yourself. You know, or the, the record or the CD you were putting in your ears. That's not the movies. So, in fact, I honestly, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very anti-watching a movie on that laptop or on your phone. You are not watching a movie if you're watching it on your phone. You're watching something. You know, but as the filmmaker, it's not the way I intended. I made this to be seen on a big screen. You know, I, I meant it to be experienced socially, not, not personally. You know, it's, it's, you can watch Lawrence of Arabia, uh, you know, or the current Star Wars on your phone, but you're not watching Star Wars. You know, you're not, that's not the way they intended it to be seen. Um, the, the U.S. Postal Service issued the Mona Lisa stamp many years ago. That was not the Mona Lisa. <laughs> that was a stamp with the Mona Lisa on the stamp, <laughs> or a depiction of the Mona Lisa on the stamp. But that you have not seen the Mona Lisa unless you go to that museum in Paris. So, so you have not seen my movie if you've watched it on an iPhone or on a computer screen or even on a TV screen. That's just not the way. You need to go out to the movies. You need to go into a movie theater. And, and I'm, I feel very passionate about this. In fact, I, I have restored movie theaters in Michigan, and I set them up as nonprofits and run them, and I program them. And, when, and I have really just one rule, other than that everybody should be able to buy soda and popcorn for $2. That's like, that's like rule one. Don't rip people off. And, uh, and the second rule is, if you're caught on your cell phone during the movie, you're banned from the theater for life. 
It is like it really works. Wow. You know, because I'm because this is not the place for that. As much as I am a proponent of the devices and technology and social media or whatever, that is just, you know, I read some crazy statistic that 17% of guys admit to having looked over at their phone during sex. What's, whoa, wow, what's going on? You're looking at me like I'm guilty or something. No, like, I just, <laughs> like my fiance just called you was like, so Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I don't understand I don't understand that I don't I don't I don't know I, I don't want us to become that <laughs> stay human use these things like she said for the good but but stay human yeah. uh, so two more hi um, I, I'm an American uh, clearly who um, started traveling abroad a lot several years ago and it took me a long time to like stop thinking America was the best at everything and to like become less defensive and be able to take criticism and be open-minded. And I wonder, like, how can Michael Moore make a movie that would, like, actually speak to Republicans and get them to, to learn what, like, I, what me as a sort of a Democrat or an open-minded person would get from this movie? <laughs> <laughs> it, I made it. It's this movie. It's this movie. They've already... The studio has already tested it amongst conservatives. Really? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not talking about the 20% that are way over here on the uh, on the uh, you know the far right. They're kind of lost souls. Okay. The you know the people that believe that Adam and Eve rode on dinosaurs 6,000 years ago. I God bless them, but I, I can't help them. But there's a whole bunch in here, you know, that, who call themselves conservatives, but they actually believe if women are doing the same work, they should be paid the same amount of money. And they want to drink clean water and breathe clean air. And they want their kids to go to really good schools. And you know, they're, they're, for, they're for a lot of good things. Uh, they just don't like being taxed. They don't like sharing their money with other people. They hate the poor, you know, like it's a disease. But they at least will have an open mind. And they, they did, they've tested this, and it's tested. I went to a screening out in Westport, Connecticut a couple weeks ago. And, and then I talked to the Republicans in the room afterwards. And then we went out to a bar after that. And it was amazing. The amount of epiphanies that these Republicans had watching this. First of all, it's the first film of mine they've seen, because they've been told not to see the others. Right, right. And I, and, I've, and I always tell a Republican, I said, you know, I don't want you to change your mind. But if you'll just watch any of my films, you'll know three things right away. I love this country. I have a heart. And you're going to laugh at least a half a dozen times during the movie. I can guarantee you those three things. And you don't have to change your politics at the end of it, but maybe it'll make you think a little bit about some things. So, and, and like you say, you, you, you reach that point where you realize we're not number one at everything. We're not the greatest thing ever invented. Right. But you love this country. Yeah. You don't want to live anywhere else. Well, I well after, watching this, <laughs> after watching this movie... <laughs> you can't leave. <laughs> you have to stay and help make it better. Sorry. All right, one quick one. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a quick one, but um, first of all, I live in Westport, Connecticut, so I can relate to that. And <laughs> <laughs> second of all, um, it's great that you make all these movies. I love them, and a lot of others. I just went to watch Spike Lee's Shira, and I was really impressed with the movie, and I wish more people would watch it, but the theater was half empty, and even if it was an opening weekend. And the terror was really small, to be honest. So my question is, movies are awesome, and uh, they're open-ended. Articles are great. But beyond the movies, how do we reach that maybe 80%, 90% of the population who are just too busy to watch the movies or too, too, too more con much more concerned with you know, making their ends meet and feed the family? Well, that's the problem. All art suffers. All art suffers. When the majority of the population is living from paycheck to paycheck, that story last week that, that the majority of Americans now, the majority of Americans, if they had an emergency, don't have $400. If they needed $400 tonight, they have it nowhere. They'd have to sell something or borrow it. You've got so many people working a second job, the Germans laughing at me there, the idea of a second job is insane to them. Right, so how do you get those people to actually start 
we have to fix the economic system in this country that is driving people's heads into the ground. That's what, that's what we have to stop this massive transfer of wealth to the upper 0.1% because it's making everybody else scramble so hard and worry for their survival that they don't have time to go to the movies or write that poem or sing that song. And we've made our, our entertainment so out of the reach of working people. What's the cost to go to a Knicks game? What's the cost? I went to U2 last summer. That was $280. You know, what's it, what's it cost to, I mean, the movies are the last place, and even that's, it's too much. You know, I don't charge more than $8.50 at my theater, and that, and that includes 3D, no extra charge. That's a ripoff. You know, I don't charge you more money because the movie's three hours instead of two hours, or two hours instead of 90 minutes. You know, but that's what has to change. There's the, the, the oligarchy, the people that exist at the top that are running the show, the small number of people that own 90% of the wealth in this country are setting it up so the rest of us just can't friggin' enjoy life. And that has to change. That has to change. And it can change. We can make it change legally, too. You know, it, that, would, that would just require a Bernie Sanders. Imagine him as president. You know, it's not an endorsement. I'm just saying. <laughs> I like Hillary. I'm just saying. <laughs> Not going to change with Hillary. Then again, she could end up being our Pope Francis. Like, where did that come from? <laughs> All of a sudden, there's a Pope that says, you know, gay people aren't going to burn in hell. So, you know, things can change, things get better, but I, I really believe that um, this is a great question you've raised that, that the theater would be half empty for Spike's film. Such an important movie. And, but my question maybe to you, all of you, and you, who has sex in strange ways. <laughs> Distracted. Just, we call it distractive yeah. sex, yes. <laughs> but honey, Michael Moore just tweeted. <laughs> We're going to edit all this out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, but I would like to, I'd ask you, your generation, this is the generation where you're not going to the theater as much to watch movies. No. You know, why is that? Why? Is, I mean, it's, a, it's a serious, not a philosophical question. I mean, it's... Lazy. Just lazy? It's, it's easier to get them. It's easier to watch it on the computer? It's, it's easier, attain, easily attainable. Easily I, attainable. Yeah. And... But there are, so I, I think, at least, I don't know what category everyone falls into, but for me personally, there are some films where I will actively go out and see them, because I'm like, I need to see that on the big screen. And some I'm just like, mm, I can wait. Or, right, so for an action film, you want to see that on the big screen. You want to see everything, right. But for this, you want to see this with other people. Wasn't and this a different that, experience? That, that plays into it as well. That plays in into here? it as well. For sure. Or maybe the movies just aren't as good anymore. Maybe there's just too much crap out there. Well, everything's a franchise. And stuff. Right? Yeah. And, and, and so which means that your generation, we're not seeing the next Kubrick or the next Scorsese or the next, you know, whatever. We're not seeing enough of the good films made by people in their 20s and, and 30s. Well, and uh, I know we have to wrap up, but just one final point, because it was really, sure. really important, and it was one of my favorite moments in the film as well, was in Iceland, the first woman president who really inspired so many young women and girls to kind of grow up and actually be more than what you know society had kind of painted them to be which oh these are only men's jobs or whatever and it, one of the most incredible things was the company boards it's by law that they have to be at least 40 percent women or 40 percent men it could be 60 percent women and 40 percent men or it could be 60 percent men and 40 percent women but it has to be that and um you know she had said once you have three women in the boardroom that's when culture starts changing. One is just a token, two is a minority, and three is when the group dynamics really start changing. So is that, could that be something that is a big start in the US of something that we could do um, to really inspire the change? Yes, that would be a great law to pass. Uh, Germany's just passed it, they're, they're at 30%. You know, I think, that w I think that we could follow the German way easier than the Scandinavian or Nordic way, um, but uh, yes, obviously, the more women in the room, the better. Where, where did that, what gender, that's so old. Uh, you don't, I don't, where, 
Who ever thought of that idea that women shouldn't be at the table? It's always better with women around. Right? I, you know, I don't I mean, your generation already knows this. You know, we, there are now, I mean, there are now more women in college than men. There, did, didn't it just last year, women in law school surpass men? Um, uh, there are now more women managers of, you know, and just the low level business stuff. I mean, there's women, I mean, things are already changing. Your generation has helped to make this change. But we're going to be better off. With, with women having a, a strong say, not a token say, but a real, a real strong say. And that's not the, I'm not just making a, like a, try to bundle all women into one group think. You know, there's lots of examples of women that have done horrible things. Well, a couple women I know, but I, <laughs> not, not, not a whole lot, but you know, it, I, I just think that, that we're all gonna be better off in that way. Weren't your mothers like that? Didn't your mothers raise you to believe that, whether you're men or women, that, that it's, it's crazy to walk into a room and have just a bunch of guys? You know, you're never going to get the best work, the best product, the best anything. And in tech, this is a real issue, yeah. you know, that you don't want to shut women out of this because that next great invention, that next great thought is going to come from what they bring to the table that you don't have as a man. You know, well, and they're starting to change that. I mean, we have this whole you know campaign with Made with Code. We're starting to teach little girls about in a fun way. That yeah, they paired up with you know Pixar and Disney to do the Made with Code campaign and with Inside Out and stuff. So it was it was really good to kind of get these girls when they're young and stuff say, hey, you can also be an engineer. Hey, you could do this and kind of teach them at a young age. So they're just not trying to figure it out when they're you know older. Yeah, I great. think I think that I hope that came through in the film that I really am a For sure. big believer in this and that and that we'll have a better world when it's when it's a shared world. And, and not just not just you and I because you know we have we have the Y chromosome and not the second X. Mm -hmm. It would have been an X, but a quad, one of the quadrants fell off, <laughs> making it a Y. That's my, my, it's my firm belief that that missing part of our second X quadrant. has the volume control, has the ability to ask for directions, <laughs> <laughs> aesthetics. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things. That you know, why why do women do better on the SATs? That's in there somewhere. <laughs> so I think, um, and I just want to say before we close too that your your main uh, your main dude here, Larry, uh, Larry Page, the godfather, yes, of of uh, Google, is a Michigander. He's from uh, Michigan. Anybody knew that? Anybody know that in here? Yes. Um, so just another great thing that we've we've given um, uh, the world. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, where to invade next is out, I think, February 12th. February 12th, and that's right in the middle of the uh, election cycle. Yes, uh, yes, we are, we, we, we're in theaters the, during the week of the New Hampshire primary. <laughs> Perfect so, timing. So, thank you so yes. much, Michael. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.